Thank you for joining us today in Jennifer Shouse and Associates complimentary webinar series. We are coming to you live today from Washington, DC. This year on Fridays, we are covering procurement playbooks. We will take a deep dive into doing business with federal agencies and departments with our panelists. On Wednesday, Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern, we will cover the FAR supplements or procurement regulations for the agencies and departments. And on Fridays, we will cover the business development and marketing aspects of the same agencies and departments. The full schedule with the sign up links and recordings are on our website. We would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. The Virginia PTAC at GMU offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on business location. If you're interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore what PTACs can offer. And a special thanks to our sponsor, the Federal Business Council. The FBC creates and manages virtual and in-person meetings and events to connect appropriate industry and government in the form of um, meetings and events um, and product providers and solutions with government programs that use them. The FBC works with admission-specific programs for a variety of agencies to connect government and industry in the form of in-person and virtual conferences, training events, policy dialogue, and outreach. Over the last 40 plus years, um, FBC has become a uh, comprehensive resource for connecting industry and federal government. Dastin is an IT and cloud solutions provider working with corporations, the military and government agencies to lower their costs, increase scalability, improve operational efficiency and meet compliance regulations using targeted cloud-based solutions. Dastin is a certified partner of Oracle NetSuite, a premier tier Google cloud partner and a certified partner of Cisco, Virtue, AO Docs and Authenticate. For more information about Dastin services or to schedule a complimentary consultation, email joe.alston or visit the Dastin website. Today we are covering the US Department of Education. Let's meet our panelists. Um, we have uh, we want to thank our friends at GovSpend, Ms. Archisha Meehan and Ms. Deborah Suarez from the Department of Education for also joining us today. Um, we will now look at business opportunities and contracting trends within FedMine. Archisha, it is great to have you with us today. I will meet myself now and just let me know when you're ready for the next slide. The floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Archisha Meehan and I am the Senior Product Manager at FedMine. Um, and it is my distinct pleasure to be here today with one of my favorite agencies and people, uh, Deborah um, Suarez. So thank you, Jennifer, for including me in the playbook series. Um, next slide. Um, for those who don't know us, um, FedMine is a federal market intelligence company that basically integrates the 18 federal data sets into one easy to use platform uh, basically allowing um, transparency and reporting and analysis that was not previously possible. Um, last year, we were acquired by GovSpend, the largest provider of data and purchase orders on the state, local, and education market. Um, the aim now is to provide the best of um, intelligence and data on the federal and SLED side. So next slide. So we do integrate the 18 federal data sets into one easy to use solution. This is just a graphical representation of all the various types of set data sets that and data that we pull in, uh, just to give you a quick look at it. Um, next slide. And typically, uh, you know, we FedMine, uh, we've been doing this since 2004, and we today are used not only by some of our federal agencies, who might use us for market research and goaling, but we also work with many small and large federal government contractors that use FedMine for um, market intelligence and uh, research. So um, next slide. So having said that, let's talk a little bit about um, the US Department of Education. Um, for those who've heard me before, I'm always going to tell you to pay attention on what 
the mission statement is for an agency, what are their goals, what are they working towards, how do they work, because that not only affects the past spend, but affects on how they're going to spend, uh, you know, what are the future trends that you could possibly see based on their changing needs and um, mission statements. So, Having said that, you know, and I'm sure Deborah is going to go over this in much more detail, but um, I found it, I, every time I'm doing the playbook series and I'm talking and I'm reading, it's always something new that I learn. So um, I found that, uh, you know, the, the, the mission statement really is to promote the student achievement and preparation for global uh, competitiveness by fostering educational excellence and ensuring equal access. I truly believe this mission statement tells a lot about what the agency is doing, what it wants to do, and it sort of also is tying into the FY23 budget. So, uh, you know, it, again, things do start tying in once you pull everything together. Having said that, uh, the Department of Education wants to work towards establishing policies or they work on establishing policies on federal financial aid for education, collecting data on America's schools and disseminating all the research, um, you know, also focusing on the national attention on the key educational issues, which are constantly changing, uh, you know, with, with changes that we see all the time. Um, and then of course, prohibiting discrimination and ensuring equal access to education. So next slide. Um, so, from the contracting perspective, I do want to point out that there are two contracting activities that take place within the Department of Education. One is under the Contracts and Acquisition Management, which falls under the Office of Acquisition and Grants Administration. And then the other side of it is the Federal Student Aid Acquisitions, which falls under um, the Office of the Principal Deputy to the Chief Operating Officer. So. Uh, keep that in mind as we keep going through or as you get more into the Department of Education. Um, so next slide. So last fiscal year, the agency awarded uh, about $2.7 billion to about 653 companies. Um, you could see the year-over-year -year spend. I believe that the FY21 numbers were affected due to the pandemic that hit and the carryover effects. So let's go into the next slide. Um, looking at how the contracts have been awarded, and this is looking at the agency as a whole, um, given what the agency does, uh, the top NAICs are related to collection agencies and credit intermediation, followed by R&D, computer systems, design, um, you know, and administrative management. So again, if you if you take aside the top two NAICS code, then you do have a pretty nice mix of the other NAICS codes that are within the agency. And they all really relate to what that agency's mission is and what it does. So next slide. Looking at our top companies, um, you know, we have Accenture, we have Great Lakes Education, we have Navient, we have Perspecta, Maximus, again, a good mix of companies, sort of again, tying in with the type of work that we saw on the NAICS code side. Um, and, um, you know, just again, gives you a quick look at what is happening at an agency and who are your top companies right there. Uh, as you use a tool, uh, as you're fine tuning results, I'll be the first one to tell you that start using keywords, start using um, socioeconomic indicators as you're doing your market research and understanding uh, more specifically what an agency is doing. So next slide. In terms of the small business contracts, uh, we have a little about $406 million that were awarded to 420 companies. Uh, the National Credit Services, um, Briefcase Systems Development, Synergy, PPS, Manhattan Strategy Group are all the top companies that are winning contracts as small businesses. So next slide. In terms of looking at further into the NAICS codes um, and the PSC codes, uh, you have your top NAICS codes of collection agencies, computer-related services, 
um, R&D administrative management. Um, also put a layer on the NAICS codes and look at your PSC codes. Um, I personally find many times that the PSC codes really give us um, as, a, as a small business a lot more information and a lot more, um, I think I, I personally find the PSC codes are uh, more relevant um, when you want to really get into the law, into the details. So do pay attention on the PSC codes too, as you do your market research. Um, typically, you know, I mean, examples could be using something like cyber and looking at the NAICS codes within an agency and understanding how that agency is awarding contracts under that NAICS code, but also look at how the PSC, what are the PSC codes that are being used and use that further as a means of researching what is happening at an agency. So, um, and then also as we go in further into category management, you know, it is GSA's categories are really based off um, uh, the PSC code. So I think we should definitely, as we, I know we all are focused on NAICS codes, but do pay attention on PSC codes as you get into market research. Um, so next slide. So let's look at the set asides that the agency is using. The, the agency has always done a great job of um, using the right set asides. And you can see small business set asides, they do use eight A's. SDVOSB set aside, hub zone, and women owned small business set aside. And I'm always thrilled to see more and more agencies doing the women owned small business set aside. Um, I kid you not, when I started doing this in 2016, that was like so small as that program was relatively new. So it's always great to see uh, more and more agencies doing the women owned small business set aside. Uh, next slide. So Let's also look at the COVID contracts, right? What happened with the COVID? What, what, how did each agency um, award contracts under the COVID-19 National Interest Action Code? And you can see that in uh, FY21 actually had $144 million that were awarded. Um, they've actually awarded to 12 companies and the NAICS codes that were used included um, activities related to credit intermediation and R&D in social sciences and humanities. So, um, you know, the links to the reports are very much there. Feel free to use them as you get more into the, once you get the slides. So next slide. Having said that, um, I also always like to see, you know, how is an agency awarding contracts under the SBIR and SDTR programs? Um, you're seeing more and more R&D happening. You're seeing um, a lot more with the changing um, missions and, and times. Uh, the SBIR and STTR programs are something that, you, that we don't think of, but I think we should start looking more and more at. Um, and in the case of education, we have a, more, a little more than $13 million that were awarded to 31 companies in FY21. Um, under the SBIR and STTR programs, and all of these were small business contracts. So um, again, if you know, do keep that in mind as you are looking at things. Uh, next slide. Grants. Um, I would say paying attention to grants, um, especially for the Department of Education, is important. Uh, research grants, see what is being awarded, understand who's winning those grants. Is there an opportunity for you to work as, <clears throat> as a sub-grantee, sub-awardee? Uh, those are all things that you do want to look at. Um, and as you sort of uh, go into the Department of Education's uh, proposed fiscal year 2023 budget, you will see there's a lot more grant activities happening there. So um, I am really understanding the importance of grants more and more as I have spent more time into the grants uh, database. Um, and I think with the new infrastructure bill, um, again, uh, I know we talked about the Department of Transportation, I think last week, it is again important to pay attention on grants. So for those of you who have not looked at grants um, and have services that you could provide, uh, Pay attention, have a look at the budget, and then 
try and get a better understanding of the grants and the grants process. Um, it might be interesting. Uh, next slide. So we talked about PSC codes and I wanted to highlight the top categories. I personally do like to get, I, I find categories help me a lot to understand um, you know, how an agency is procuring or even how the federal government is procuring, right? Um, use keywords, put on keywords and see what happens. Um, uh, but, but pay attention on categories, gives you a good overview top level, further gives you a very good understanding of how those contracts get awarded under small and large, uh, small and other than small business. But when you are analyzing those numbers, pay attention to what the agency's mission is. And then further start looking for opportunities as a sub subcontractor too for some of the large contracts. Um, most, of, most of the times you'll find that a lot of times the contracts themselves will have a subcontract requirement. So those are the ones that you wanna start paying attention to if you're a small business or trying to enter an agency and use that um, to create those prime sub or subprime relationships, those mentor proteges and the joint ventures. So again, <clears throat> this is just to give you an idea of how you could use the data to create your strategies. Um, so next slide. And then, of course, uh, you know, if we talk about categories and category management, we have to talk about our major IDIQs and vehicles that are being used at an agency. Again, this is top level, but it is always so interesting when you start putting in keywords and NAICS codes and, and seeing how that agency might procure on vehicles. Um, why is this important? This is important because it gives you that information or that intelligence on whether do you need to work with any of these companies do you need to work as create relationships or do you need to start thinking about getting on any of these vehicles or especially when the when it opens up or when onboarding is happening um, you know if you're an 8a company um, and you can see that the agency is awarding contracts using 8a stars too um, if you're on 8 stars 3, I would absolutely use this type of information to figure out when are those contracts that are on 8 stars 2 expiring, what is the work that is being done, and create those relations again and try and see if there's a way for you to get those possible contracts as they get recompeted, if they do. Um, so next slide. Subcontracting, very important. Um, this data is coming from USA spending, which gets its data from FSRS. This is different from the data that a lot of the primes are that have subcontract requirement plans are required to report into ESRS. Um, that data is not made available publicly, hence we are just reporting the subcontract data that is made available publicly. So last year we had about $143 million that were reported as subcontract awards to 120 companies by 16 primes. Um, quick look at your top NAICS codes. Um, absolutely, you know, we did see that the credit intermediation NAICS code was one of our top NAICS codes. A lot of contracts were being awarded as other than small business, but you can also see that there is a lot of subcontracting that is happening by those large businesses. Um, so here's a quick look at your top NAICS codes. Um, let's go into the next slide. In terms of your top primes, again, Accenture, General Dynamics, Veritas Capital Fund Management, these are your companies that are awarding those subcontracts to your, and your top 10 subprimes. Uh, Subawardees include Smooth Stack, Quality Information, um, you know, uh, 20 bridge so again a good mix of small and large companies from what i can see uh, next slide so once we've done our market research and we've got a good understanding of the market of the agency specifically to the type of work that we do um you know whatever that whatever your core specialization is um you know we now want to understand what are the opportunities out there within that agency that we can go after 
and I'm always telling clients, uh, and what I have seen from the most successful companies is the understanding that, you know, the opportunities really come from understanding the agency, understanding the initiatives, what are the new initiatives within an agency, and that really depends on the agency's need and funding that is available. And then the second part of understanding the opportunities that could be coming out are also looking at contracts, especially service type contracts that could be recompeted. And as a small business, absolutely we want prime contracts, but a lot of times we are also looking at the subcontracts and creating those subprime relationships. So those, in my opinion, are the opportunities that you create for yourself based on the type of work that you do. Um, but how do you get that information? So of course, you know, we're looking at SAM.gov, paying attention to the pre-solicitations and the sources sought notices that are provided, um, looking at the expiring contract searches based on what you do. If you are on any of those IDIQs and GVACs or BPAs, look at the task orders on those specific vehicles or IDVs that you might be on. Look at the budget and program information that you can get from, um, of course, the budget, but also from your Exhibit 53s and 300s. Um, and I know that education does do a good job of also coming up with a forecast of opportunities. So you want to pay attention to all of that as you start creating your pipeline of possible opportunities. So next slide. And um, so one of the things that, especially if you're in the IT-related industry, uh, looking at your Exhibit 53s is super important. You get a lot of good information in terms of understanding what is what are the major IT initiatives that have been budgeted. You can see year over year budget IT spent. Again, helps you with your planning, understanding what is the opportunity out there at an agency. Um, next slide. <clears throat> Part of your Exhibit 53s are your Exhibit 300s. Again, um, the 300s give you a lot more information. They tell you what, you know, how the CIO is doing. And in many cases, you'll actually find that program manager's information too. So if you're in IT, pay attention on your Exhibit 53s and 300s. Um, next slide. Um, the, so we talked about, you know, the initiatives, the Exhibit 53s, 300s. You also want to pay attention to what is happening in terms of your um, opportunities that are uh, expiring. And this is just a quick look at, you know, almost one and a half billion dollars in contracts um, that are expiring that were awarded as other than small business in the next 12 months. Um, here I, you know, I've listed these by contract number, so you could easily go in and do your research and see if that is something that you want to work towards or, or work with some of these uh, larger companies that have these contracts as a sub. Uh, next slide. Um, so again, quick look here by place of performance as also by, uh, by the various SNAKES codes. And they sort of do tie in with how that agency is procuring. So next slide. And then this is just looking at the contracts that are awarded as small business. Um, if you are a small business with an 8A, pay attention on those 8A contracts that are expiring. Do searches based on keywords, um, 8As, and also put in like an 8A expiration date. So you could do searches even based on when an incumbent 8A is, um, 8A is expiring. Um, next slide. And as you break them up further, these are your top comp top contracts that are expiring. Um, again, if you feel that this is something that you can do better, uh, absolutely talk with the agencies um, or even talk with the existing prime and see if there's a way for you to work with them. Um, next slide. And this is again looking at the expiring contracts, giving you a quick overview in, of the next codes, and then of course the place of performance. So next slide. This is a quick look at that uh, I just did for open opportunities just now that are out there. 
some expiring tomorrow. No, on Monday. Uh, but just just gives you a quick look at how you know tracking your opportunities. Put use keywords. Use things like pre solicitations and source of sort. And if if you do see a source of sort and pre solicitation, do respond to them. In many many cases, this is how the agencies looking for new solutions and doing their market research. So please do 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 respond to them. Um, next slide. So we talked about, you know, understanding the agency, what is, you know, understanding the mission, looking at what you do, using your keywords to do your market research on an agency, and then using that to create a possible pipeline of opportunities. Um, as we, one of the things that you've heard me talk a little bit about is the budget. Paying attention to an agency's budget is very, very important, um, and especially when you start looking at education. So, um, what from what I read, uh, you know, the FY23 budget request is for about $88 billion. It's a $15 billion increase over the FY21 enacted levels. Uh, with and you'll find as you read the budget that it is all tying in with what the agency is doing. Um, you know, it wants to provide aid for schools that have a high poverty rate, uh, provide for, for students with disabilities, and provide access to higher education and college completion. Um, you know, they want to lower costs for American families. All of us who've had to pay, write our checks for our kids' education, uh, we know it's, it is not easy. Uh, you know, <laughs> provide tuition-free community college and expand support for HBCUs and tribal colleges. I think, again, that is a huge mission. Uh, you know, uh, HBCUs do so much, and it is really good to see that, you know, they want to provide support for that. A um, couple of things that I found interesting, I have two grown-up boys who've gone through college, and, um, you know, I was happy to read that they do want to improve uh, and implement FAFSA simpl simplification because that would be really good. Um, of course, improve IT security improvements. And I was actually focused a little bit on the program administration, uh, which is seeing an increase of about 118 million over FY21 enacted levels. Um, and that is really going to be used for staffing building modernization and renovation activities that would really help cut down the rental costs, um, IT securities, and enhanced data collection. So I know I've sort of put a lot of information, um, but you know, again, you have access to my emails. Feel free to reach out at any point of time. I'm always ready to help our, um, you know, our small businesses. And um, I think at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Deborah, and uh, you know, I can tell you from my personal experience, the Department of Education has an amazing small business office. So, Krista, Jennifer, um, uh, Krista, I'm going to hand it back to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Artisha, and thanks for a great overview. Um, we will now move to an inside perspective from the government provided by Deborah Suarez. Um, Deborah, it is great to have you with us. I'll mute myself now and just let me know when you're ready for the next slide. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Uh, is my audio loud and clear? Yep, we can hear you great. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, thank you. I'm excited to be here. My name is Deborah Suarez, and I serve as program manager in the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. Our acronym is OSDABU, and yes, uh, just like Narnia and uh, the Yellow Brick Road, <laughs> um, we we uh, the, the, our acronym is a funny one, but uh, but we do serious business. But before I continue, I, I want to say thank you for this invitation. Uh, the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization takes our outreach very seriously uh, to try to reduce barriers. Uh, for small business participation in order to meet the mission of the Department of Education. So thank you for this invitation. Uh, my director, Calvin Mitchell, would have been here himself, but he is at this very moment giving a presentation um, at another conference. 
uh, but otherwise he would have been here, but he knows what we're doing and he is very supportive of this effort. I also wanna say thank you and hello to Archisha. You're, uh, I've, been, I've known you for a few years now and I so appreciate the work that you do. I appreciate the product FedMine. Uh, we use it um, all the time and it really does inform our work. But I also wanna say thank you to you, Archisha, and your team for always being available to us. Um, I was taking notes while Archisha was speaking. I wish that I had the ability to press a like button uh, <laughs> during her presentation. But in the absence of a like button, I took a couple of notes and I want to just echo a few things that Archisha has already shared with you. Uh, first of all, Archisha talked about knowing the mission of our agency. Yes, I, I'm clicking like for that. Um, also, uh, she mentioned understanding the two contracting offices, CAM and FSA. So I'm clicking two likes for that. Uh, additionally, some tips she shared with you are to be open uh, to subcontracting possibilities. I'll be talking a little bit more about that. Um, to be to really understand the uh, the work of the agency and to begin to look for our work under those keywords, uh, PSC codes. I think that's a very very uh, valuable tip. Also, uh, Artisha mentioned to be learning the needs and initiatives of the agency. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that as well. That is so key when you engage with us. And the last thing I wanna click like on well, in, in for Archie's uh, presentation is to respond to sources sought, to respond to RFIs if you are able and if it is within your business strategy. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so um, with that, let's uh, go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. All right, so there is the general link to the Department of Education. I'm going to suggest that um, as we're learning about the Department of Education, what's even more important than our general link is to do your deep dive into each of the program offices. Each of our program offices, or what we call POCs, Principal Office Components, uh, each POC will have its own internal websites and um, on that they will they will have their own mission statement and how the mission of each program office contributes to the larger mission of ed. They will have um, where you can sign up for stakeholder newsletters, email distribution lists, uh, links to their resources, links to their products. Uh, I always recommend to make sure you really get a, a look at the individual program office websites, because that's where you're going to start really learning the needs, the initiatives, and the priorities. And then of course, there is the link to my office, the small business office. Next slide, please. The link to our acquisition forecast, um, always an important one. And thank you to Archisa for the shout out to Ozdebu's forecast. Um, we have received kudos for the, the forecast and it is a good place to start, but it is by no means, uh, by no means the first place and by no means the only place. Next slide, please. Uh, you find the link there to the scorecard. Uh, the Department of Ed is on track for receiving an A for the last scorecard. We received a grade of C for the prior, the one prior to that, unfortunately. Um, and there are lots of reasons behind that. Uh, but um, and that has to do with uh, certain types of spend. Uh, and then before that, we've historically received very high marks uh, in the A's. So, but you can take a look at the scorecards and get a feel. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we do through Ozdebu is we will have uh, what we call our small business conferences. And usually they're half day. Now, uh, post pandemic, they're virtual. They are no cost, of course. Uh, it's paid for through our taxpayer dollars. It's no cost. But um, we will have specialized topics. Our next one is on subcontracting. In the past, we've had conferences based on uh, socioeconomic concerns. For example, a woman-owned small business, um, hub zone, et cetera. Um, but you don't need to be a WASB or a hub zone, or you don't have to really even be interested only in subcontracting in order to attend any one of our conferences. 
I think that you can get lots of good information and they're available to anyone who anyone who would like to join, especially now that it's virtual, we can include hundreds of small businesses. Um, so I encourage you to visit our, our website, but even more so, I encourage you to get into our database and that's how you'll actually get updated information. And I have uh, slides a little bit later on that will tell you how to get into our database. But this is just one upcoming conference. Next slide, please. So I really appreciate the way that I was engaged to, to uh, participate in this conference today. And I was asked to think about the best practices for businesses engaging uh, with the department to help them succeed. And I appreciate that frame of thought because it allowed me to really think about it and say, well, if I were to come down to my five top tips, um, I think it would be the ones that we have listed here. Um, you know, uh, my, my job in Ozdebu is to, as I've said, to uh, work toward reducing barriers for small business participation in Department of Education procurement. And uh, in order to do so, when I work with small businesses, uh, what I do is I try to demystify the department, right? Um, you, when you come to the department or any agency, it's you, first time out, there's lots of information and it's, it's not always easy to try to, you know, make your way through the weeds. So what I try to do is to demystify the Department of Education as best as I can in order to help you in your business strategy, right? Um, so if I can help shed light on internally how we do things in the Department of Education in the procurement space, then um, you can make your best decisions in terms of how to engage, how you communicate, where to engage. So I really appreciate uh, that I was asked to think about top practices and I have them here. And I'm first gonna talk about learn about the Department of Ed. Secondly, I'll be talking about our database uh, the small business database and how you not only how you can register but how you can use that database strategically as a marketing tool as you try to market your business to the department of education i'm going to put a plug in for one on word one on one virtual consultations with ozdebu and then a little bit more about um, our resources uh, with a highlight on our conferences and then other resources just a little bit about myself so you can understand the perspective that I'm coming from. I've been with the Department of Education for just over 10 years. Uh, prior to joining the department, I was a teacher, classroom teacher, English as a second language is my area of specialization. Uh, after getting my PhD, I then was a professor for almost 15 years, professor of teacher education, again, specifically in ESL. I joined the department about 10 years ago in a program office, and I was in the Office of Career Technical and Adult Education, and I was continuing my ESL specialization, and I ran national teacher education projects for uh, teachers of adult English language learners. And then I just became fascinated with internal workings in the department, and that's when I started to work more on the administrative side. I moved into the front office uh, in Octe, working closely with the assistant secretary. Uh, then for a couple of years, I worked with the White House initiatives, the White House initiative on Asian American and Pacific Islanders. And we were based, uh, really our focus at that time was on uh, business, businesses. And I've been now with Ozdebu for almost three years. So I, I, I give that background to you so you can better understand where my perspective is coming from. Very much coming from the program side, the mission side, but then also sprinkled in how the department works internally and, um, and doing business with the department. So I think that might help you to understand where my perspective is coming from. Okay, great, next slide, please. So this is uh, very similar to what Archisha has shared already, um, but I, I have a lot to say here. <laughs> so uh, the mission promotes student achievement, preparation for global competitiveness by fostering educational excellence and ensuring equal access. It's really important to understand how the US Department of Education works in terms of what we do and what we don't do. Um, I'm gonna start with what we don't do. The U.S. Department of Education, unlike other countries where the Ministry of Education really runs education in that country, 
right? A, a minister of education in another country can look at his or her watch and see that it is 11 a.m. and know what every fifth grader in the country is doing, right? Uh, not so here. Um, in, the, in, the, in, this, in, in the United States, the decisions of curriculum, the decisions of textbooks, the, 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 the decisions that, are in, that really affect the classroom are at the local level. Okay, so those decisions are at the local level, they're at the state level. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education does not get into those decisions of textbooks. We do not get involved in the curricular decisions. And it's important to realize that because um, in the small business office, you know, very frequently I'll have folks who are experts in education and maybe they were teachers, maybe they were professors, maybe they were researchers, and now they've created their own um, small business. And um, it you know, makes sense, come to the Department of Education. I've created a website that helps kids learn math, and this should be in every school. Or I've created um, a structure that can be used in you know, playground equipment, stuff like that. And so I, I, I always say, think about the product or the service that you provide. And if it's something that is at the really is at the local decision, you need to be going to through the locals. Or if it's something at the that we do um, affect, then of course you're talking to the right people. If you're talking to the U.S. Department of Ed, so keep that in mind. Um, what your product and your service is that something that is decided at the local or the state level? Or at the U.S. level. So let's talk about the U.S. level. So what do we do? We have four major activities. First is related to financial aid. Second is related to research. Third is related to problems and issues in the schools. And fourth is related to um, civil rights. Okay, using federal data. Uh, I'm sorry, federal 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 uh, monies uh, in the way that they're supposed to be used. So let's go back up to number one. If you understand these four major activities. Okay, you'll better understand how we could use the products and the services that you provide. So the first, the first um, bullet, the first bullet there uh, is referring to the Office of Financial Aid. So what we do is uh, the Office of Financial Aid or FSA establishes policies related to federal uh, financial aid for education. They administer distribution of those funds. They monitor their use. They also do other things not listed here. They um, will have call centers around the country. There's also a lot of training um, that's needed. Get the training out to the schools, get the training out to the guidance counselors, the parents and the kids. So uh, the activities for number one are primarily through FSA federal student aid. When I first started in this position, um, FSA was described to me as the fifth largest bank in the country. And so whatever a bank is going to need, FSA is going to need, and then some. So that might help you as you think about what you provide and where you might fit in. The second, the second bullet there is research. Um, now, research with a capital R is, um, is a very specific thing. And the researchers out there know what I'm talking about. It's very different from, say, um, a promising practice. But this is research with a capital R. There is only one program office that legally is allowed to do research with a capital R, and that is IES, Institute for Education Sciences. The Institute for Education Sciences is the second biggest spend in the department after FSA, and that and it does all this work related to data. So uh, IES has several research centers, statistical research centers, they, uh, it's in IES where you will find the large scale, large scale surveys that are done, National Center for Education Statistics. Um, what do they do? They will, they will create, they will design surveys, large scale surveys. They will design the surveys. They will conduct the surveys. They'll collect the data. They scrub the data. They prepare the data sets for researchers. They prepare data sets for private use within the federal government. Um, they scrub the data in that way. They will um, analyze the data. They'll, they'll create reports that will report out the analysis. They disseminate the information. And depending on the scope, they will then begin doing training around those, um, those results, if, if there are any particular outcomes that are relevant to um, schooling and education. 
massive, massive amount of work there and specialized work. All right, the third, uh, identifying major issues and problems in education and fo focusing national attention on them. Uh, as Archisha has already shared, grants and grant making is a very big part of the department, the department's work. The Department of Education is a very, very large grant making office. So I mentioned that um, uh, that you know the U.S. Department of Education does not get involved in the, those lo uh, those local school decisions around curriculum and textbooks, for example, or even instructional techniques. Uh, but we do fund the schools, and so so it's important to know how the U.S. Department of Money, U.S. Department of Education's monies get to the states. So um, so uh, the Department of Ed funds the states through um, formula funding, which is based on US census data, right? So monies will go to the states in that way. But the US Department of Education also has discretionary grants. Those discretionary grants will be based on um, priorities, right? And so, and there are grant competitions around those grants. So what I always suggest to folks um, who are interested in uh, helping the mission of the Department of Ed is to follow that money, to follow how the monies are going from the Department of Ed to the locals, to the states. One way is pretty easy. We'll go from the U.S. Department of Ed to the state departments of education, right? And then the state departments of ed will then begin to use the funds and distribute that funds and how they're going to, however they're going to do that, as long as they are within federal guide, guidelines. Um, now, federal D Department of Ed federal monies don't always only go to state departments of ed. It all depends. Sometimes those those grant monies will go to the State Department of Labor. So you, you have to see, you know, where the monies are going. Um, so in the case of adult education, there are some states whose adult education, community colleges are not in the State Department of Education, but in the State Department of Labor. And there are some states, so you just have to follow that. Um, so many of, in terms of grant making, many of uh, the kinds of services that we will procure are related to per, uh, supporting those grant making functions, all right? And there are lots of ways to support our grant making functions from um, conference, pr providing conferences, training for our reviewers, creating our data sets, you can just imagine. So, so there is quite a bit of procurement for number three around supporting our grant making functions. And then the last one is about ensuring that those federal monies uh, and, and other federal statutes are, um, are equal and that you're following those guidelines. And that really falls into OCR, Office of Civil Rights, to make sure that um, you know, we're prohibiting discrimination in programs and activities that receive federal funds. So I've said a lot here uh, because it's, it's more than the forecast, right? It's, it's more than a past contract. This is what we do. These are the activities and, and um, beginning to understand them. That's how you really understand not just where you know, the procurement needs are, but where the future procurement needs might be. Thank you, next slide, please. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about how ed is organized. Uh, and I really appreciate, Archisha, again, that you talked about the two different contracting offices. Um, the one you mentioned is CAM, Contracting Acquisitions and Management. CAM will take care of the contracting space for all of the program offices except for federal student aid, right? Federal student aid, FSA, has a separate, separate contracting office. Um, I appreciate that distinction. So here we have three major um, sections, the Office of the Secretary and the DEPSEC, Deputy Secretary and the Office of the Undersecretary. Uh, and then you see the different program offices or POCs organized beneath. And I've already you know, shared Institute for Education Sciences is that top box there, that the top bullet there in that first box, um, et cetera. But what I want you to get out of this uh, slide is the following, that we have roughly 20 program offices. Every program office will support the mission of the department with its own mission, okay? And the, each program office will have an executive will have an executive officer who's in charge of those administrative functions including anything below the simplified acquisition threshold each program office is going to have um, 
um, a, a very high level career person, a deputy assistant secretary that organizes that, and then typically also a political appointee um, who is then serving and reporting up to the secretary. You'll see White House initiatives here, and I've actually mentioned White House initiatives. Um, White ha we have a several White House initiatives, the uh, Center for Faith and Opportunity Initiative, the White House Initiative, well, actually I have to change that one, but the White House Initiative on Hisp Hispanic Prosperity. We also have the White House Initiative on Historically Black Colleges and Universities, um, and also on um, Educational Excellence um, in African American Education. The titles have changed a little bit than, than, than what's listed here, but here's what's important to note, that for the White House Initiatives, they, ex they, they're placed in the Department of Education for different reasons. They exist through executive order, but they're placed in the Department of Education, and uh, but they, they are part of the portfolio, the White House portfolio, the Office of Public Engagement. I mention this particularly for this reason. It's not so much that there's a whole lot of uh, procurements coming through them, because there, you know there are some, but that's not really where the big dollars are. But if you do work, that is related to any of these areas, you know, uh, for his for Hispanic education or Hispanic opportunity or or HBCUs or or faith based. If you do work in that space, well, you know, here's a community for you, right? A potential community. So I would say engage with them. You know, go to the website, see how you can get engaged with the work that they do. They do a lot of public engagement work. Um, I do want to have a call out for the uh, initiative on American Indian uh, and Alaska Native, I'm sorry, a White House initiative on um, Asian American Pacific Islanders. Some of you may be aware of that. It was at the Department of Education. It has moved and it is now at uh, HHS. So it's still around, uh, but it has moved. Okay. So that's what I wanted to wanted you to get from this slide is uh, the individual program offices and they operate very you know, individually on their own mission and in their own space. Each office primarily is going to um, administer a particular law or laws and um, and if you're going if you, whatever the work is that you do, chances are you're going to find find it in one of these program offices and you just have to go to the website and dig deep. You know, I had someone come to a small business come to me just recently about uh, what the work that they do is related to school safety. And they were like, well, I'm not quite sure where, where, where I'd fit in. Well, we had to dig deep, right? We had to go in and we found where there are, there, there are grants uh, related to school safety. So you really need, need to dig deep. Um, I guess there's one other thing I want to share in terms of demystifying uh, is this. Each one of these program offices, or rather most of these program offices, they're going to have a public face, right? Most of them. Uh, let's take the one Institute for Education Sciences. I've already shared with you that they are our second largest spend and they are um, they have the individual research centers. Well, they're doing that for a reason, right? They, they want to have their data sets that they create and they've scrubbed now. They want to have those data sets used by the public. Um, and then when they create products and resources from that work, they want that to be used by the public. IES has an amazing website where you can go in and you can do keyword searches. You know, pretend that you're a stakeholder, right? Say you're an educator, put yourself in the perspective of the stakeholder. So IES stakeholders are educational researchers for the most part. Put yourself in their, in their shoes. Go to the website, start doing um, a keyword search on those areas that you're interested in, ESL education, and you will get um, actual products, um, whether it's um, you know reports that have been done or research reports that have been done, you will get products that have been created through uh, IES and probably through a contract. And you'll get the, inf the content information, but what other information will you get? You'll get the contract information, right? You'll get the contract number you'll get the contractor who did that work. Typically, you'll get the name of the, pro the project manager. Typically, you'll get the name of the program manager who supervised that work. So um, it really is very beneficial to approach a program office as from, from the perspective of a stakeholder, because then you begin to get the information that they provide to those stakeholders, and you begin to understand the real work that they're doing 
and the work is done by contractors. Okay, um, let me make sure I'm saying everything I want to say here. Okay, I guess the other thing I would want to say is that um, some, some of our program offices are internally focused. So if you look at the middle box there, the Office of Finance and Operations first bullet, the Office of the Chief Information Officer second bullet, those offices are, are inward facing. So OFO really deals with Office of Finance and Operations, deals with our internal workings. That's where you will find our HR. That's where you'll find our, our, our internal training, learning and development. That's where you'll find our EEOC. They are working on a diversity and equity statement. Um, we're going to be seeing some information coming out there related to diversity and equity. And then OCIO, Chief Information Officer, they handle a lot of the, uh, the internal operations for IT, cybersecurity. Okay, I'm ready finally to move on. Next slide, please. Okay, then there's Oz to do. That's us. Uh, so our role is, as I've already shared, to uh, maximize participation of small businesses in ed, uh, trying to reduce barriers to small business participation. Um, many of you probably know that the Small Business Office, or OSDBU, exists through federal mandate. We exist through the Small Business Act which means that every federal agency should have an OSBU. So what does that mean for you? It means that one entry point for you into a federal agency is the OSDBU office. And it's by no means the only entry, but it is a good starting point. So if you're interested, your small business interested in work with Ed, uh, contact OSDBU and you'll have a, you can, you'll learn all about our resources. Um, for the purpose of today, I want to emphasize that OzDebu not only does outreach, but we do a lot of what we call inreach. In order to reduce barriers to small business participation, yes, we do outreach such as what I'm doing with you right now and one-on-ones, but what's really important is to work with our fellow ed employees, our, our fellow ed staff, the program officers, the program managers, the contracting officers, the contracting specialists. So we do a lot of work internally talking with our individual POCs about their acquisitions that are coming up and their acquisition strategies, right? And so we do a lot of that. And especially under um, our, our current director, Director Mitchell, we are really engaging in those acquisition strategies at the earliest stages as possible to begin to identify which, uh, to do market research and begin to identify which um, procurements really can follow a particular acquisition strategy. The last box there all the way to the right, you'll see our key roles that we do. Outreach, established partnerships. The third bullet is what I'm talking about, acquisition planning with our program offices. We also do a lot of policy, we oversee procedures, and for the first time we've created a policy guide for our, uh, our, our, our colleagues in ed. We do an enormous amount of training, enormous amount of training for our, our for our colleagues in the contracting office, training about the small business space. And then of course, we watch out for the small business goals. I can share with you, not only does Ed have um, overall goals, but every program office has goals as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so here are Ed's F, uh, FY22 small business goals. You can see our prime is 14, uh, subcontracting 37. SDB, we've all been raised up to 8.25, and um, and then 5% uh, for, uh, for the other socioeconomic concerns. So as I've shared, uh, this is our Department of Education small business goals, but every program office has to come up with goals for the coming year. And we do that We in the very beginning, we're getting ready to do it now for FY23. Um, we will meet with our um, each individual program office and we will talk about their previous, um, their previous spend and their previous activities in engaging with, uh, with um, small businesses. And we will work on a small business goal for every program office. We negotiate and, and we're always trying to push that just a little bit. Um, the socioeconomic concerns remain the same for every program office. It's the, uh, the, prime, the, the prime goal that will change. Um, how do we fare on these um, business goals? Uh, next slide, please. Oh, 
I guess I don't have it. Can you please go back to the previous one? Thank you. Okay. Um, so, but I wanted to share uh, that we, ha how have we been doing in meeting our goals? And you can see this on the scorecard. Um, we have been meeting our prime this year. We have met our prime and our subcontract. Last year, we just missed it, just missed it. But before that, we've been making it. Uh, we have done historically very well with women-owned small businesses and meeting our goal. And before the 8.25% for SDB, we've been doing very well with our small and disadvantaged businesses. But we miss SDVSOB, uh, Service Disabled Veteran-Owned Small Business, and we miss the hub zone goals. And I'm putting that out there uh, because it's already out there, but I want to share that this is something that um, our senior leaders are following and they know about and they care about. Um, and if you are an SDVSOB, if you're a hub zone, then, um, you know, we need you. So I just want to say that we are missing those goals, uh, but we are very seriously paying attention to them. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, there's really not, I, I know that I think Archie's uh, dollars are, uh, um, uh, slides are a little bit better on the dollars here, but still um, to talk about that you can see here to pull out our total spend for the past two years, as well as our or as well as our socioeconomic categories. So you can see the, uh, where we're falling and and where and where where we're not. And this, so these dollars just really uh, support what I've shared that we're really struggling with SDVSOB and HubZone. Next slide, please. Um, again, um, the NAICS codes, um, you can see here, I know that when folks are new to the Department of Ed space, they're always surprised, credit intermediation, collection agencies, what's going on? Well, remember what I've shared, the FSA is a large bank. And so anything that they're going to need, uh, anything that a bank is going to need, FSA needs, plus additional uh, work. Then you see their computer, uh, computer systems, that makes sense, right? But then look at that, research and development. 541720. Now, hopefully, you better understand where that's coming from. That's coming from IES, Institute for Education Sciences. Okay, that's where that's coming from. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so I've mentioned already that FSA is our top spend by far. And then our second top spend is IES. And then you can see where the others fall. OCIO, again, internal workings, that makes sense that they're our third largest spend. OFO, again, working um, with um, issues across the entire department, HR, learning and development, talent division, EEOC, all of that is an FF, OFO. So that makes sense that it would be one of our top. OESC, Office of Elementary and Secondary Education, I've already shared that the Department of Ed is a huge grant maker. That's what we do. We're a grant making organization. And many of our grants or most of our grants are coming through OESC. So that's where that top spend is. But don't, uh, you know, if this isn't one of your areas of, of products or areas of service, that's okay. Take a look at the other program offices because each program office, again, most of them are going to be uh, having grants that they're getting out the door. And um, most of them are also going to be having some sort of contracting activities provided through national activities funds, most typically. Um, Archisha mentioned the CIBR program and in our agency, uh, uh, the CIBR program com comes through IES, Institute for Education Sciences. So if that's something of interest, you'll find CIBR in IES. Next slide, please. Okay, top contracting vehicles, there you go. Um, don't need to read those to you. Of course, we are trying to push all the levers that we can. Again, Ozdabu is, uh, you know, we work to reduce barriers to small business participation. We work to, we work to meet the mission of Ed through the, uh, you know, through reducing small business participation. So we're going to push all the levers that that we can, all the acquisition levers that make sense. Uh, but here are the contracting vehicles, and I want to share with you that, as I as I said a few minutes ago, that we are doing internal training. So you know, here's a list of top contracting vehicles. What do you do with that information? I'm just sharing with you that we are giving training. We invite um, the, the you know, GSA to come and to talk about these contracting vehicles, how to use these contracting vehicles, not only to our contracting staff, 
but also to our program offices. We want them to know a little bit of the side of the pro of, of the contracting side, not just the program side, because we want to have them thinking about small business from the earliest stages of acquisition planning. So top top contracting vehicles, and um, we have them come, we have them do the training for our internal staff. Okay, next slide. Let me talk a little bit more about what we do to help small businesses, uh, what OzDoo does. So um, we do something which is really, I believe, an amazing resource for, um, for small businesses. We will give you a one-on-one -on -one consultation. And it doesn't have to be only one, and you don't have to only meet with one of us on our staff. There are four or five of us. We're a small team, but mighty. We are a mighty team. Uh, but you can meet with us, you can meet with me and then meet with one of my colleagues because we all have different perspectives, we all have something different to offer. These one-on-one -on -one consultations will, are now virtual um, and they will last from 30 minutes to an hour and you know what will we do? It, well, it would be your time. So we could we spend this time. Uh, we hand the time over to the small business. And if you want to give us a capability briefing, that would be great. We want to hear about what you do. We want to have some bit of information about the the products you provide and the services you provide. We would have more of a conversation about those program offices. If hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at our forecast in advance. Hopefully you've had a chance to uh, put up your SBCX profile in advance. We can talk about any contract actions that you've identified and see what information we can get about that. Um, often we are not able to talk about specific contract actions. So that's when we would connect you with other small business advocates who are able to talk about those program access, uh, pro program uh, to, who can talk about those uh, contract actions. We'll talk more about ed resources. And as I've said, we can talk about your profile, make sure that you're using it as a good marketing tool. So I'm putting in a plug. Uh, if this is, if you're interested in doing uh, work in the ed space, we are here to uh, meet with you and to provide resources and information to help you make your business strategies and how you're going to engage with us. Next slide, please. I want to spend a, a minute, and I know I'm beginning to run out of time here, but I do want to spend a minute talking about this thing called SBCX, Small Business Customer Experience. This is a database internal to the Department of Education. If you have heard of SBCX before um, through HHS, uh, yes, indeed, we purchased this through HHS, So, but it is a di it's different. You might be registered in HHS, but that doesn't mean you're registered with us. So this is a database specific to the Department of Education. So you'd go in there um, and you would put in your, uh, your DUNS number or now your UEI, and a lot of your business information will auto-populate from SAM, but then there are different areas where you can put up information. And so this is a, market, a marketing tool for you to use to market your business to the department because we use this as a market research tool. Um, you can put in keywords describing your business. You can upload capability statements. So we no longer need to have capability statements flying through emails, right? And did you attach it? Did you not? You don't have to do that. You attach it there and you can attach as many. You, there's actually a large function where you can attach several items. So some small businesses attach CAPE statements. Some small businesses attach past performance, right? Especially if they haven't had past performance yet in the federal space, but they have past performance at the state level or the, in the commercial sector, or maybe even as a sub. So they can you know, put up information, put up uh, PowerPoints of, of products and services, et cetera. Um, it's also a tool that we use in the Department of Ed to then communicate. So we now have that e email list, and when we, for example, will have small business conferences, we'll send out a blast to everybody registered in SBCX. Hey, here's a small business conference, register here. Or we'll get information from a program office. We just released this RFP, can you blast it? And we'll blast it. We also will um, send out RFIs and sources sought. And right here, I, wanna, I do wanna take a minute because I want to build on something that Archisha said earlier, and I wanted to come back to it. Archie just said you respond to RSI, RFIs and sources sought. And I want to echo that. And I know that's a business decision, and we certainly don't get on top of business decisions, but why is it possibly a good idea? 
because in Ozdebu, we're working with our acquisition staff, right? Early in the stages to try to try to try to understand what's you know what are the capabilities that are needed, and then to, and then to do market research to to inform an acquisition strategy. More and more, the program offices or and CAM they're sending out RFIs and sources sought. If small businesses don't respond to that, then they wind up saying, oh, no small businesses responded. We don't have you know, we can't support a small business set aside. We can't support a WASB set aside, we, we, you know, and that's what happens. And I get it. I understand that it takes time and money to respond to RFIs and sources sought. So that's why that's a business decision. From our perspective, we, we would encourage you to take a look at those and to, to know from this inside government perspective that what we're doing is we're trying to figure out the best strategy. That's what's going going on, the best acquisition strategy. And then you decide how you're going to engage with that. I want to talk about, the, come back to the point of internal training. We are doing a ton of training on small business customer experience, not just with our, not just with our contracting staff. We are training our program offices on how to use SBCX. And what we're doing is we have a train the trainer that we've established. We're working with a couple of folks from each program office. We're teaching them how to use SBCX and then they are in turn training their, their folks. Um, you know, for, having been in the small business office now for a few years, one of the first things a small business says to me is, can I please, I wanna get in front of the program office, right? I wanna get in front of a program manager. And sometimes that doesn't work because we may not know the program managers who are doing the work, but you know who knows the program managers who are doing the work? The programs. And so by our teaching them how to use SBCX and getting them to use it as a market research tool, it's one little way that we can help small businesses kind of get in front of a program manager. Okay, and if you were to accept a one-on-one -on -one with us or, or ask for a one-on-one -on -one with us, we can talk about SBCX in greater detail and we'll share our screen and we'll look at your profile and we'll, we'll give some, some ideas. Next slide, please. Okay, basic information, how you uh, get into, um, you know, register for SBCX. There is the, the, um, the URL register and then you'll get approval. Um, sometimes there are, there, are, you know, there can be glitches as with anything, but we are very responsive and we have a great small business contractor who runs that program for us and they are incredibly responsive. So it's pretty easy, pretty user friendly, but if you hit a glitch, hang in there and we'll help you. Um, just, just remember that uh, you'll have a help and you have my email and there are lots of ways to get help with this. Next slide, please. Um, I do want to say you might be worried, oh, you know, what about sensitive information? Um, this is a tool, again, to for us to build our small business supplier base. I'll say it again. This is a tool for the Department of Ed to build our small business supplier base, okay? So that means that other businesses cannot see your capabilities. They cannot see your contract data. It's only Ed staff. And um, and we do approve which head staff um, can get in. So um, there's you know so so that's that's how we maintain that privacy. We haven't asked. Oh, can is this a, is this a tool for teaming? No, that's not really what we had established this for. Um, if you want to talk about you know learning about other folks in the department who are already doing business for potential teaming, we can talk about that. And our chief has already shared some really good data on current contracts and the holders of those contracts. But uh, SBCX is for you as an individual business to market yourself to the Department of Ed and then for the Department of Ed to go in and, and, and find businesses uh, who have certain capabilities. Um, I do wanna say sometimes we have the question, oh, do you have a mentor protege program in the Department of Ed? We do not. Um, so we would refer you back to SBA. So those are a couple of questions that we get that I wanted to put out there. And I think I'm just about done. Next slide, please. More resources uh, and on our SBCX site, you will see a lot of resources that we believe will help small businesses wherever they are in that stage of uh, being procurement ready for the department, right? So every small business is at a different stage. Every small business needs something different and we realize that. And so we have a range of resources that we provide. Um, active contracts list, forecast, um, et cetera. And next slide. And there we are, That that's the team. 
small and mighty. Uh, Director Calvin Mitchell, there's my name. Uh, and then we have our uh, small business specialists and then our policy lead, Samira. As I've said, you're welcome to reach out to us. There's our email address and our phone, and we welcome hearing from you. Reach out to us if you have any questions about any of the information that I have already shared. Reach out to us for a URL for getting into the small business customer experience. Reach out to us if you just want to hear about our next conference, uh, and certainly reach out to us for a one-on-one. -on -one. Once again, uh, don't be shy. You do not have to pick one of us. You can meet with whoever uh, it happens to be available. And then at another time, you can always always meet with another staff member. We're all different people. We have different experiences and different insights. And I do believe that is it. Great, thank you so much, Deborah, for a great overview. Um, and thank you to our great speakers, Archisha and Deborah again, um, and to our sponsors and to everyone who attended the presentation today. The recording and slides will be available by close of Business Monday. We look forward to seeing you next week as we dig into the Environmental Protection Agency. The FAR supplement will be on Wednesday and Playbook on Friday. The registration links are on our website. Then that concludes the webinar. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy your weekend.